third chapter. New Testament. Keep going past Ephesians. Galatians. Or actually, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. How's that? Third chapter. This is a story. Actually, it's a letter. When was the last time you got a letter that didn't come to your computer or your phone? It came to this thing called the mailbox. They used to send letters back in the day from one town to the next. And Paul's writing, Timothy, all these different people in the church trying to give a message of what God is doing in their life and in the life of the church. Because, surprise, surprise, people in churches need to be encouraged. Does that sound remotely appropriate for you? You're here because we're here to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, that God takes us and he brings us into a transformational relationship with him. He wants us to change. That's what transformation is. Transformation is talking about change. And when we're looking, again, we're going to look right now at Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 12 through 21. Let's hear from the Word of God. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Jesus Christ first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I do not say that I have achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm going to read that again. Forgetting what is past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree at some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine, Paul. And learn from those who follow our example, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they only think about their life here on earth. But we're citizens. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior, and he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Amen? We're in a situation where God is at work in the world to bring everything under his control. His control. Which means he's got this. Which means that God is in control and we need to get our minds, our lives, our expectations, our assumptions about life in alignment with these words. I know in my life I have like that little Hershey Park thing going on here. You know, the super duper looper in my emotions. Come on, have, you, have any of you ever been on a roller coaster? By the way, when I picked up a, a Russian student over in Harrisburg years ago, 
He said, Grisha, let's go to let's go to this place amusement park. And we'll ride. I read online they have super duper looper. I said, why are you even saying? <laughs> he wants to ride the super duper looper. Because only a Russian can say. And he was crazy into it. And there's a sense that we like that experience of going up and going down and experiencing all this drama. Drama. But what God wants is for us to trust Him for the outcome. That God is working in you, He's working in me, He's working here in this church to bring about change that reflects our relationship with Him. And I appreciate, Diane, the, the prayer that you snuck in there for Holly and myself. And I don't usually do this, but I do believe God has called me here to be with you. I am the thorn in your flesh. <laughs> I am the, the fly in your suit. Because I trust God for you. Before I ever knew you, I was itchy. And I was expecting. And I was ready. And when I met this church, and you asked me to come and serve as your interim pastor, I can tell you, I have been ready. Not for all the drama. I've got girls at home, I don't need it. Thank you, thank you. The three of us are now living in exile. But drama is just not my thing. But transformation is. Because I know what God has done in me and He's already done in you and what He's going to do in this fellowship. What He's doing is going to continue to bless you. Hang on. And this week was really dramatic. And last month was really dramatic. And people's feelings get hurt. So usually what pastors do is they, they preach, they teach, and they pray, and then also have to experience what goes on in the church parking lot. In other words, what goes on outside of this building. And what, that, what I'm saying is that sometimes there are people's feelings in this fellowship have been hurt outside of this room. We're missing Doug and Kappa. Last month, we're missing D, B and B, Betty and Becky, and that's not acceptable. I'm not here to beat you. I'm not here to reprimand you, but I am here to tell you that God's expecting change. That we would love with a love that's so captivating, so real, that people want to be here. And I accepted, and the reason I believe that I'm the right person to come here is it because of my stylish tie and my snappy dressing? Because I knew that would get giggles. Because you're thinking, how many pastors or hospice chaplains. That's a heavy thing, isn't it? In a few minutes, I'm going to tell you a story about a friend of mine who's turning 100 today. Anyone else can say that? <laughs> How about if we have to lift your arm up for you? And the reason that I think God has called me here to this place is because I've been a missionary, which means I'm willing to take whatever God gives us and believe Him for a future that doesn't exist. And I'm also a hospice chaplain, and I'm used to dealing with people who are grieving. And this church is grieving far deeper than I ever imagined. Are you, are you tracking with me? Or 
or are you listening? I'm the only one that's allowed to have this headpiece on with the wire here and should be listening. Okay? Anyone who's listening to the Eagles game, you better just appropriately yell out, Amen! If you hear a score. Amen! Oh, come on. You do not have your feet in. Because they're playing right now. So. Let me check his ears. Does he have your feet in? Remember back in the day the transistor radio used to do that? But I'm here with you. Not that I'm saying that you're under hospice. What I do understand is that you are grieving. We've had so much dramatic change in such a short time that we have to hold on. Hold on to each other. But this scripture tells us we need to hold on to him. The very beginning of this chapter, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Whatever happens, that means he's expecting things to happen. Crazy happens. Flat tires happen. Difficulty happens. Disappointment happens. And I never get tired of telling you these things. This is what Paul's writing to the church. I never get tired of telling you these things to safeguard your faith. You know what that means? He wants you to know, and he wanted the church in Philippi to know that you're going to have things that happen that are going to discourage you. Things that are going to disappoint you. Things that are going to confuse you. You're wondering what I'm doing with my phone. I'm not calling anybody. I'm just looking at some slides. Okay. Hello, Mom? <laughs> That's terrible, because my mom is now in heaven, so I don't know how I would do that. Yes. But God wants to safeguard you. Safeguard. He wants to protect you. He wants to keep you intact. He wants to make sure that you don't give up. Because faith is the ability to trust, and giving up is the upside down of that. We are coming into this day with a cup. I love how this church does that. The children are like this. How ridiculous would it be if they were like this? Do you know what I'm saying here? You cannot. Are you going to be poured up? Fill up? It's just going to come. And we cannot come into this worship service. We cannot come into this place. We cannot come into this day, this week, this with ourselves positioned in a way that we are shutting out God. God wants to fill us. He wants to pour into us. He wants us to be cups that run up. He loves messy love. That we are, okay, there's messy broken people, but even cooler than that is that there's messy love, that it spills on each other. Imagine honey spilling all over you. We have an amen? <laughs> Drippy. It's so good that it's just licking your fingers. That's the kind of love, that's the kind of expectation we should have today is that God wants to protect us and then he wants to fill us. And it says here, that in order to go forward, in order to take those steps of faith, you have to have a little bit of amnesia. You must forget what has happened. Forgetting what is past and going forward. Do you know what grief is? It's holding on 
Because we're so afraid of loss. We're so overwhelmed by the loss. We're so stricken by the things that have hit our heart. And we can't let go of them. This church has gone through major change. And it went through years of wonderful growth. And amazing things happened in each of your lives. Pastor Kelly touched you. She encouraged you. Jen blew you away with praise music and, and worship. And Ashley and Brandon were here to challenge the kids and give us a vision. And you grew and the numbers increased and the faith exploded. So now that people are missing, you're wondering, has God left this place? They ran a race with you and helped you run in such a way that it would be the next stage and they have handed that off to you with training that you might trust the things that they have taught you just like Paul, that you might live for him, you might trust him body, mind, spirit, that you would live as the church in reflection of who he is. The people. One of the things that encourages me when I go into a hospice room and somebody is dying, one of the questions I ask, are you at peace? Are you at peace? Do you know why I say that? It's because I can't stop them from dying. I cannot stop change from coming. I can't go back to the way things were, the way they used to, to be, because otherwise all my kids who have kids and husbands would be living at home with us right now. Still mowing my yard, making the ribs, walking the dog so I can sit around and do nothing. That's what they believe, by the way. You can't. And you change with it. And you have to come to a place where are you at peace with what God is doing in your life now? And what has he done in the past? And you look at that and you say, God was with me. God blessed me. And he's going to continue to do that. Because God is in the business of blessing his people. God is in the business of blessing you. Which way is your hands? Are they down or are they up? God wants to pour himself out into you today. He wants you to understand that you and I must press on. I went to this woman who's turning 100. Believe it or not, she's a hundred years old. Grew up old order Mennonite. You know what that means? You get to wear the same clothes all the time. <laughs> what color are you wearing today? Black. What are you wearing tomorrow? Black. What are you matching with that black? It's like so easy. I mean, think every god wants to, to, to wear those clothes. And when I met her, she was angry. And I was introduced by another chaplain who was leaving, said, she's going to be yours, and I want you to visit her. But she had a lot of hurt, an enormous amount of hurt. Growing up, not a good relationship with dad. Broken, bitter, and angry at God. So how helpful is it for me to come in and say, hi, I'm your hospice chaplain. She's a gal, I'm a guy. And she did not like the fact that I walked in probably just as handsome as her dad. Who knows? You know how people look at you and they have expectations and they think that this is going to happen and going to play out one way? And she was angry. And for the years... For six months, 
I met with her. And every time, she, I listened to the same stories over and over. This is what happened. This is how I felt. And I am still angry. I didn't know old order men and I people could be angry. Because they're supposed to be simple people. Supposed to be peaceful. But she was so hurt and so angry. And the reason that I'm so glad that she lived to 100, not just because it's a cool number, but because she's at peace. Because she has seen a transformation in her own life where she's gone from being angry with mom over their dad to remembering, she said, in the middle of all that, every night, when I would watch my mom come to my room, drop to her knees, and hold my hands, and pray with me. God will get you through. This is a way to sum up those prayers. And she held on to her child, even though she knew things weren't right at home. Held on, held on, held on, held on, and believed, and trusted, and prayed, and hoped, and expected, and didn't give up, and guess what? This little girl grew up to be a hundred-year-old woman who has a gazillion, half of Lancaster County are her relations. By the way, that's the way it works. They're everywhere. Some of them actually wear cooler clothes. Because younger people change. But it's amazing that God has brought something new to her. So I'm asking you, did the people who have sacrificed since 1833, isn't that the right number on that brick outside? Am I the only one that looks at me? Yes, that's right. right. <laughs> Don't you look at the brick? <laughs> you walk outside, and there's all red bricks, and there's one of the bricks that's not like the others. <laughs> One of those bricks just doesn't belong to founding stone. And it says they're founded, established a long time ago. This church has gone through a gazillion changes. A million changes. Because I don't know how many a gazillion is. And God has walked with this people, of whom you are a part. Because God has a plan to keep pressing on, to keep going forward, to keep taking us and putting us in a new situation. When I decided to preach this sermon, I went into my files and I cheated, okay? Just gonna be straight up. I pulled a sermon from October 30th, 2011 that I preached at another church to another group of people. I'm having technical difficulty here because, there you go. And then I decided that I'm gonna do a series two months ago on transformation. The reason I'm saying that is because anything that's recent I didn't even know what was going to happen. I had a quote from John Wimber, who is a big church growth leader. It says this, Many of us treat church life like immature adolescents. From other Christians, we want thrills, constant exhilaration, and to have our needs met. When Christian brothers and sisters fall short of our expectations when they are boring, usually it means the pastor. Probably should strike that. <laughs> and imperfect and fail to meet our needs for strokes. Do you know what that means? To encourage you to say, what a great job, you're amazing. Because we all really do need them. We pout. We turn away, we isolate ourselves from them. Jesus calls us to be mature and to have a mature commitment of love for his people, 
and the very people in this fellowship. Do you know why I put the disclaimer in there, right? 2011, seven years ago I preached this to a completely different, vulnerable, <laughs> trusting congregation who are sitting there going, are you talking about me? <laughs> to this present situation, are you talking about me? Are you talking about our situation? Actually, God is talking about this situation. Because we're always struggling with that transformation. Are we doing that which is human? That thing which is natural? Or are we doing that which is spiritual? Mature. So I'm asking you that anybody that's not here today, <coughs> that are not secretly hiding in bed watching the Eagles game, anybody that you see missing, tell them you love them. Why was there no amen? Amen. <laughs> You're saying amen that they're not here? No! You missed the sermon! Reach out. They will know you're a Christian by our love. And the difference between, like I said before, the Old Testament and the New Testament is grace, peace, and love. It's not harsh, it's holy. It's a love that will not let anyone go. And last week I talked about going the second mile, remember? And I remember standing here just going, this is harsh stuff. Jesus said, go the second mile. That means somebody has already gone the first mile that they never wanted to go to do that which they didn't really want to have burden them. And Jesus said, all right, cool, do another one. And it's in the second mile when we go the second mile with each other, the people will see that we're only doing it because God is in us. Because he takes grumpy and turns it into God. Come on, grumpy is a real word for most of us a lot of the time. Not just pre-coffee. Pre, I should say post-everything. God needs you. God needs me. God needs First Baptist in Marstown to be his church. And that means loving, loving. Because people are grieving. People are wondering. People are fearful. People are expecting. And when they, don't, when they come and they don't see things the way they used to be, they get anxious. And I want you, I want you to have a mature love that will not let them go. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have a little cue card for you. Mm -hmm. It's easier to buy a vow than get an amen here. Come on. Anyway, another gentleman who I like is named Ed Cole. He says, maturity doesn't come with age. It doesn't matter how old you are. It comes with acceptance of responsibility to do what God wants us to do. But you, you are so wise. <laughs> Would you bow with me in prayer? And take us and cause us to forget that which has gone on before when you have taken hold of our very lives, Lord, it's not just about us accepting you and welcoming you into our life, but to yield our lives to you that we might love one another, that we might live up to the expectations that you have for us to be your community, to be your family, to be your church, to be the love of God that people see. When they see this, they'll see the smile, they'll see a, a hand that's held out to bring them home, even if they've hurt us, even if they've confused us, even if they've disappointed us, Lord, that they would understand that we are still here because you are still here with us. You do not give up on 
on us. So therefore, Lord, on this second mile, we go with each other and even ourselves. Lord, that you would give us faith. It's not that we've already obtained all this. We have not arrived at the goal. But Lord, you tell us to press on because Jesus Christ has a hold on us. And we will not.